This is Bible Academy. We are in the book of Zephaniah. We should be finishing up this book today. But before we do that, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege to study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Zephaniah chapter 3, by way of review. If you recall, in verses 1 through 7, we saw many of the symptoms of a spiritually sick Jerusalem and that their certain destruction was coming. We move to verse 8. We began to look at Judah and the other nations in relation to the other nations, to both their near and future day of the Lord, which, of course, is the main subject of this book. Verse 8 began with the command for the believers to wait, which also implies trust in the Lord, Let's begin reading as review in verse 8. Therefore you wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I rise for plunder. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger. For by my fiery jealousy all the earth will be devoured. For then I will restore to the people purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord, to serve him with one shoulder altogether. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, will bring offerings. On that day you will not be ashamed. Because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for then I will remove from your midst the proud boasters, and you will never again be arrogant on my holy mountain. Verses 12 and 13. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel will do no just injustice and not tell lies and a deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouth for they will graze and lie down and no one to make them tremble. Here we begin to see the type of people who enter the kingdom of God from among Israel, from all the Jews. They will be humble and lowly, they'll be seeking refuge in the Lord. They will be the remnant. They will be telling the truth. Uh, no lies or deceit will be found in their mouth. And they will find comfort and their needs in this future kingdom of God. Now the closing verses of this book, beginning with verse 14 through verse 20, are in great contrast to the opening verses of this book. If you recall, the opening verses spoke of the great judgment and devastation that was going to fall upon the entire earth, anticipating the future day of the Lord, when the Lord comes to judge the world. Now these closing verses center on the saved people of God, and particularly it's addressing Israel. It speaks as though it's talking of Israel. Sometimes it sounds like just Israel, and that's often the case. It's in mind of the, the uh, prophet as well as the people who hear this, that God is talking about the Jews, Israel, and particularly in this particular time in history, Judah. And it often has a reference to the capital city, 
Jerusalem, with whom the Lord is present in the time of these celebrations of joy and an appreciation of his love when that future day comes. Verse 14 begins with four commands to the believers who have remained faithful. Now remember, this is from Zephaniah back in the 6th, probably 20s B.C. with the historical day of judgment, still part of future history, but it is coming and it will be there soon. Here's what they hear from the prophet. Zephaniah 3.14 Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Here we see some similar lines and similar phrases. The shout, of course, is a command. And it's in the setting of joy, so many translators insert the interpretive phrase joy, to distinguish it from another kind of shouting, like shouting in, in a battle cry or in pain or something like that. So uh, we uh, interpret a little bit here and put in for joy to help us understand what they're shouting about. O daughter of Zion, that is who addressed. That's another name for Jerusalem. Uh, being called a daughter indicates there's a relation to Zion. That's the mountain upon which both Jerusalem and the temple were built. You've heard Mount Zion many times if you've been in these studies. Then we have a second shout, again, a plural, to all the people in Israel. All Israel is told to shout out loud. Now also, this may carry a, an idea of not just joy, but victory, triumph. They've arrived, they've gotten there, they've been through what they needed to go through. And then we see this phrase, rejoice and exult with all your heart. We don't use the word exult too much today in our common conversation, but it's the idea of being excited. We do use the word excitement a lot. And that's usually the result of something good happening to you, and that's the case here. Uh, rejoice and exult. And then notice, with all your heart, it's genuine, it's from down deep, it is real. Another thing we should observe here is a stacking of the commands. Shout, shout, rejoice, exult. To emphasize what should and will go on here. When this future time arrives, it's a tremendous time of joy. It's a joyous occasion for the believing Jews. And they are just to let it go. Just let it all out in their joy and celebration, as we might say today. And the last address says, O daughter of Jerusalem. This probably has the same sense of meaning the people of Israel, uh, a daughter in the sense that they're related to Jerusalem, the products of Jerusalem. It's like Jerusalem is their parent. Uh, Jerusalem, of course, is the historical place of God's presence and temple. Uh, the central city in, in Scripture. Again, we see this sense of relationship between the people of Israel and Jerusalem. So, Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, all the Israelites, all the believing Israelites, that is, are to be rejoicing at this time. Now, remember though, this is addressed to a people from Zephaniah to the people of Judah who are about to be clobbered by the curses of the covenant and their own historical day of the Lord. But, as a believer, well, let's get one of my famous timelines up here. And we'll put the cross in. Basically, the cross divided history. And we look at this and we see back in 621 B.C. 
there about 40 years or so from 586 when the Babylonian army sweeps in to Judah and takes a significant number of people away for some 70 years and slaughters almost all the rest, but there are some survivors. <clears throat> we know that from the story of Jeremiah, what happened to Jeremiah. So, at this point, just a few decades, perhaps even less, when Babylon comes in, the people are to be shouting for joy. Even though the believers who know their scripture know the curses are coming, <clears throat> They know that great destruction and slaughter and misery is coming. They are to stand here. Let me draw one in here. And look forward to the day of the Lord. That is the one that is promised in many Old Testament books as well as New Testament books. They will have their own return back around 516 B.C. But it will be nothing like the day of the Lord. <clears throat> when who we know now as Jesus Christ will come back and set up his kingdom of God on earth. They are to look past the great miseries that are coming in 586 that will carry on for a couple of generations. Many of them will die in the captivity as they get older and the years pass. But even with this great disaster coming, they are to look forward and shout with joy with what's coming. There's certainly some application here for us. When we're about to face our miserable circumstance or we're already deep in it, take a moment to stop and think. This will all be over one day. And it'll be nothing but joy and happiness and pleasure being with our Lord in his kingdom. That's hope, folks. That's also knowing that it's going to happen. We believe it's going to happen. It's more than the way we use hope today. This is a firm confidence. It will happen. And as surely as I'm sitting here and you're listening to this, this will come and it will happen. Guaranteed by God himself. So believers with faith can look beyond the troubles that are coming or to put it in practical terms today, what troubles we're in, beyond the suffering, beyond the loss of life to the exceedingly wonderful time of being in the presence and security of Jesus Christ forever. <clears throat> now, in the next verse, verse 15, I'm just going to leave this little uh, chart up here for a moment. Keep this in mind. Because I want you to keep in mind what these people are thinking at this time. Because this is the time in which they are. They've got a lot to go through. Verse 15, again, it looks forward to that wonderful time. <clears throat> The Lord has taken away your judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You will never fear evil again. This is these believers to picture themselves in that future kingdom. It says the Lord here, that's the name Yahweh. We've said it many times. It's at the Grammaton. That is also the covenant name. The Lord has taken away any judgments. It is over with for believers. Once the day of the Lord comes, the Lord's presence, um, 
Though the nation will soon go through great discipline, there is a time when the nation will be intact in the land of Israel with the Lord ruling. When that time comes, there will no, be no more suffering. The Lord will protect you, provide for you in every way. Now the emphasis here is on the source of great pressure that has been on the people. So when they see this future time, they see these judgments taken away, they see a time when these things aren't going to be around anymore. They're over with. They're completed. The judgments have been a source of great pressure on the people. Today we might use the word stress, strain. That's been taken away. So that's the first thing we see in this uh, first line here of this verse. The Lord has taken away your judgments against you. There's no more judgments for the nation of Israel. No one will have to suffer judgments for Israel's violation of God's rule. All the enemies have been completely removed from the promised land. That's what it means when it says he has cleared away your enemies. No more threat. No more enemies to the north or to the south hanging over there waiting for their time to advance and attack your nation. That is over with. You will never fear evil again. Even at the end of the millennium, when Satan gathers up the unbelievers of the world to attack, the Lord's the one that protects you totally and quickly. Perhaps we can sit back and watch, but we're as secure as we ever were and will be. Then these most two and rather remarkable comforting lines. Let's bring this back up again. <clears throat> The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. Think about what all these words mean. The king, the king of Israel, that would be the promised son of David, Jesus Christ, also called Yahweh. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is Yahweh. And this, of course, is a reference back to the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, who was called the king of Israel. This is the Messiah. This is the anointed one who will rule among the people in your midst. I've never lived in a place where we had a, a king uh, over us. I know some of you live in places in Europe where you have kings, and uh, or particularly I think of England, and and uh, but it's not like they're out there making all the decisions. They're not personally responsible for your welfare, uh, your protection. But Jesus Christ will be, because He's also God. Look at a little phrase in your midst. It's a particle plus a word. Let me show you. A particle is the word like in. Mitz is the word karib. Oh, I don't think I can get it up there. Let me see here. Karib. Okay. It means midst. Uh, sometimes uh, we translate it among you. That's the idea behind it. Here he is among, addressed to the Israelites, addressed to the Jews, uh, believing Jews, believing Israel. And then the last line, let me just put it up there by itself. Another one worth looking at. You will never fear evil again. Now, evil is sometimes translated uh, different ways in different contexts. Some might have disaster something in the negative uh, experience that we don't like. But the word there is evil. It's the basic word for evil. Very common. Ra. That's the word for evil. And I 
left the word evil in there to portray all the bad things that can happen to believers on earth. Here it has to do with the disasters that they've seen and suffered as a result of evil, rebellion against the Lord, including the covenant cursings. So, you will never fear evil again. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. <clears throat> Verse 16, listen to what's next. I'm going to still keep that chart up there. It's not in the way. And that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. We see these phrases like hands fall limp and says, what does, does that mean? I know what limp hands are, but what does it mean here? We're going to look at that. First of all, we have two commands to the believers of this future Israel to not be afraid. And again, remember, we're jumping back and forth between the near historical fulfillment and the far historical fulfillment. When you see these things that are universal, that are truly fantastic, you're almost always talking about the future day of the Lord. In this future day, do not be afraid, O Zion. Notice, first of all, uh, it's said to Jerusalem, and the future day of the Lord, once things have settled down, Jewish believers who trusted in Christ at his return will have entered the kingdom of God and their mortal bodies. Um, still, they may be trying to get over some of the horrific experiences they've been through. Uh, they've seen during the tribulation, during those final days. And now they're told, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Hands hanging limp is an expression that has to do with hands that are no use to you. They're helpless. They can't do anything. We like to use the expression paralyzed with fear, and even some of your translations uh, put that interpretation in. This implies that God's people in his kingdom on earth are going to have things to do. In other words, you're going to have things to do with your hands. Just don't let them become useless to you. So, here's one of the scenes we have. From the standpoint of believers who are going to go through the historical day of the Lord, let me put this over here, uh, just to distinguish it. <clears throat> historical day of the Lord, which is sort of a preview of the big one, the day of the Lord, they're going to go through some difficult times, but then the people are going to start to return, and things are going to get better. They'll get back in their own land, they'll rebuild their cities, their walls, even their temple, but it won't be anything like the temple before, like Solomon's. But they do experience some respite, you might say, back in the land course it's another generation or two down the road when that happens but things are better never as good as, as they had been and not even hardly comparable to what they will be in the future so now when he says do not be afraid O Zion do not let your hands fall limp there's a dual application the near day of the Lord that's going to be coming back to them in their lifetime and then the far distant one and this would be addressed to those who do go through, let's put the second advent here, who go through the final tribulation period. A lot of detail in there that we've seen both in Daniel and you'll see it in Dr. Luganbill's revelation. So they're not to fear, they're not to be afraid. And this implies that God's people in his kingdom on earth are going to have things to keep themselves busy because they're not supposed to have their hands limp anymore. Now that's more than just perhaps beyond an implication here, but you're not supposed to be afraid anymore. That period is over with. 
And there's nothing to fear in the kingdom of God for the believer. In verse 17, we return to the Lord's God's presence among the people and see how he responds to those who are faithful. Now remember, Jesus Christ during this kingdom will be ruling on earth from Jerusalem in the temple. He'll be ruling in what will be formulated as a the nation Israel, and then he'll also rule the entire earth. You might say that he rules from the nation of Israel over the entire earth. Verse 17. <clears throat> the Lord your God is in your midst. He is a warrior who can deliver. He exalts over you with joy. He will cause you quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. It begins by saying the Lord your God is in your midst. The Lord God is now among the people that are spoken to. So this would put him and the people in the future day of the Lord, kingdom of God. He's described as a warrior who can deliver. He's delivered them from tremendous trials and tribulations in the last few years. And of course, the application of the day in which this was written, he will keep you alive if it's his will for you. So look at the word warrior. Many people don't think as God as warrior, but that's actually a term used for him as we see it here. Let's put it up here. The word for warrior, Gabor. That's how it's said. G-I-B-B-O-R. Basically, this word means mighty one, a strong person, valiant, a champion. Here, the Lord your God, who is among you, is also called a warrior. He will deliver you. And that's something good to know. The Lord will do battle for you when it's necessary, whether it be in the office or on the battlefield. It says also, who can deliver? He is a warrior who can deliver. Yasha is the word for deliver. We sometimes translate it save. Now the context here of him being a warrior and him delivering as a warrior would probably be even more accurately portrayed as meaning that he is victorious in battle. So he is a victorious warrior. He's delivered his people. He saved his people the same time he's battled the enemies. We see this at his return, at his judgment upon the earth. A beautiful picture of it in Revelation 19.11. Here we are talking about the warrior God of the Old Testament and the warrior Jesus Christ who returns riding a white horse, who judges and makes war upon all his enemies. Revelation 19.11, I did a, well, I was, had to take a sermon, you know, basically how to do a sermon when I was in seminary, and I used this passage, and I think the students, as well as even the professor, was startled as I drew the picture of Jesus coming back, riding his white horse with blood on his robe, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because many people don't think of Jesus as a warrior. He is, folks. He comes back and he slaughters millions of people who are trying to not only kill his own people on earth, but him. It's quite a scene. 
here we're told that when we are there in the kingdom of God, and I use the word we now because many of these verses, of course, apply to us. We're not Judah. We're not Israel. Of course, there may be some Jews out there, but if you're a Jew and you're saved, my friend, you're part of the New Covenant Church, and you're going to go up into heaven as soon as Jesus comes back. But you will return and be in the kingdom of God with all the Gentiles. So there we are together with Jesus in the kingdom of God, where he is visible. Uh, I use this word, hearable. And he is there to keep us safe and secure with him forever. Our warrior, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the next line in our verse. He exalts over you with joy. I love this verse because this is something you don't, you don't hear about or read very often. Uh, the idea is to uh, sing. He exalts over you with joy. It can include singing. Uh, this is uh, not only the people that this is addressed to, but those of us today who will be in the kingdom of God. Now the next line is difficult to translate, and that's why you have a number of different translations. It's a combination of the word and um, is it uh, how, how's it be under how is it to be understood even after you get the translation. The general idea is that the Lord will provide the believer in the future a time of peace and quiet. That's why I understand it when it says he will cause you quiet in his love. Um, some translate it, he is said to be quiet in his love. Now, I do think the Lord is doing something in this verse because he's doing something on both sides of the verse. So I put it that way, that he's, he will cause you quiet in his love. He'll give you a time of quietness. Some translators change the Masoretic text pointing and come up with another translation. He renews you by his love. And even that isn't too far off, but I don't like to change the Masoretic text unless it appears to be absolutely necessary, the pointing that is. So I take it as I have it here. He will cause you quiet in his love. I know that's a little ambiguous, but the idea is that you're quiet. He loves you. Uh, he, he provides a quietness and a peace. Security is, a, I think, in the idea there. The next line, he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Now, this, again, is amazing to me, like the one I have underlined up here. Our Lord Jesus Christ will be thrilled over being with his believers finally gathering in faithfulness with him. It says he will even rejoice with shouts of joy. Now we're going to get to see Jesus shout in joy because we're with him. So we'll be shouting, he'll be shouting. What a wonderful time that will be. Believers will rejoice with him and he with them. Well, we had one difficult line in that verse. In this next verse, we have a couple of more. Verse 18. I will gather those who mourn about the appointed feast. They came from you, a burden to her and reproach. Well, you can see right now that this verse is a little bit confusing in its interpretation. It was just as confusing in trying to translate it, believe me. And that is why you see variations of tr translations again in your uh, versions of the Bible. But we can get th some things here, I think, pretty straight. Those mourning are the faithful who see the defilement and abuse, the lack of respect towards the sacred vessels, ve uh, festivals, that is, festivals. This would be uh, those Jews 
who during the day of Zephaniah saw such disrespect, uh, perhaps just ignoring or defiling the festivals that were set in place by the Mosaic Law. Um, it says here, I will gather those who mourn about the appointed feast. That would be the believing remnant. They will be taken away. As we saw in the captivity, they will be taken out. Now notice this next line. They came from you a burden to her and reproach. Well, these are serious wor worshipers who, who had come to Jerusalem to worship. They find that their feasts have been made a mockery. And we've learned about the spiritual leadership was pathetic. But now we see they came, they're gathered out. They came from you, that's Jerusalem. And then we see a burden to her and reproach. Now, consider you being Jerusalem. A burden to her and reproach. That would refer to the things that are going on in and around the temple during the feast. I told you it was difficult. So Jerusalem here is personified. Found with all this junk going on around her. There's a deep term. It's called a burden and a reproach. It's not a solemn or joyous occasion anymore. All the activity regarding the feast has become a joke. It's amounted to a reproach. So what this verse is saying, let me just go back and show it again. I will gather those who mourn about the appointed feast. There's your believers being gathered out. And now speaking to Jerusalem, they came from you, a burden to her and a reproach, because they were having to deal with all of this. The Lord pulls them out. And then it's destroyed. A little hard to follow there, but I think we can get that. You know, the writer of Lamentations, we usually consider that Jeremiah. He writes about some of the things that were going on at the time. Jeremiah was a contemporary of, of our, our, our prophet Zephaniah. He wrote, spoke to the southern kingdom also. I have considered doing that book extremely long. And when you do an extremely long book, it's going to take you probably a year or two, especially if you go into some kind of detail. And I have to ask the question, I want to take an entire year out to Jeremiah. Uh, probably even longer. So I'm having to think about how I'm going to approach some of these longer books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah because I would love to cover them, love to teach them, even Genesis for that matter. All right, Lamentations has the writer expressing some of the feelings about what's going on around Jerusalem at the time of its most miserable condition. Listen to Lamentations 1.4. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed feast. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan, her maidens grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Now, at what point this is exactly? It is in bad shape. It is in bad shape. Not even a place worth going to worship to anymore. The idea is that the city of Jerusalem had to deal with a lot of mockery, disgrace, and shameful activity during those days of judgment. It was a reproach to her as the foreign army swept through the city, destroying, burning, looting both the city and the temple. Later on in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 12, it reads, It is nothing to all you who pass this way, referring to Jerusalem, 
Is it nothing to all you who pass this way? Look and see if there is any pain like my pain, which was severely dealt out to me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. So if Jerusalem is complaining about all the pain they're having to go through. Well, let's continue with Zephaniah, verse 19. In verse 19, the Lord continues to address the believing Jews who will be reconstituted to the land of Israel. Behold, I will deal at that time with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame and gather the scattered and turn their shame to praise and a name in all the earth. <clears throat> First line, behold, I will deal. The word deal, the same word used in 118 for the Lord making, I translated it making, when he brought a complete end to all those who had rebelled against him upon the earth. So, here I translated it deal, the way the, deal, the, way the Lord will deal with these people. I will deal at that time with all who oppress you. This is to believing Israel. I will rescue the lame and gather the scattered. Now, Let's talk about that for a moment, both of these things. The Jews have been oppressed, scattered for centuries. We see the Lord going to deal with them. Let's look at the word oppressed for a moment. Ana. It means to afflict, to do violence, to mistreat. So first we see the Lord dealing with all who have oppressed the Jews over the centuries. Many are going to die. These people who did this, uh, from this from this immediate history we see back in the time of Judah and then in the future, they will die and they'll be in torments. And then after the last judgment will be sent to the lake of fire forever. Many will, well that is those who are alive during the time of the tribulation, will see first the judgments on the earth during the tribulation, then they will die in torments, and then later the lake of fire. So there's no ending in misery for those who have mistreated God's people. And that is one reason, that is one reason these people get so severely judged, the way they've treated his own people. However, God's people, uh, the Lord's people, are also viewed here as sheep. That's where we get this line scattered, the lame. I will rescue the lame and gather the scattered. The lame would be any inflicted or afflicted Jewish believer over history. Like so many of these promises addressed to believing Israel first, but then these also expand to all Christians as we know the relationship between Abraham and Gentiles come in through Christ and we too become all members of the family of God. Of course, this wasn't going on back at the time that this was written, but we know now that under the new covenant it's Jew and Gentile together. So like many of these promises addressed to the believing Israel back in that day, they expand to include all Christians. Now, the scattered in particular, we think of the Jews, the Israelites, who've been taken, left, forced out of their land uh, for centuries for whatever reason. Still, for the most part, they are scattered around the world. There's a large group, of course, in Israel today, but the majority are still outside and scattered around the world. The last line here of this verse, let me just put it up there by itself, talking about the Jews and turn their shame and turn their shame to praise and honor in all the earth. We'll look at that word honor in a moment. 
I actually like a better translation, which is what I put in our translation. I'll show it to you in a moment. Let's talk about what's going on. The Lord Jesus will turn their shame. The word for shame, it's another word for humiliation. There's not a lot of definition here, another options. Bosheth, it will turn their shame, their humiliation, to praise, to hila. It means adoration. Admiration. That is probably a better term for today. Admiration. That people be admired for what they've went through and where they've came. And then the word I translated honor, I'm going to just go ahead and I actually should have changed that. Put it into what the original says and in, in, in its in a literal sense. A name. That's what it means. That's the word, a name, shem. Name implies reputation. So They'll be praised and they'll have a name in a sense of reputation. That's where I came in with the word honor. They'll be honored. The idea is there's, there's fame, there's renown, uh, there's some glory there. So they'll go from shame to praise and a name in all the earth. That's the idea. So let's look at our translation as I have it here in 19. Behold, I will deal at that time with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame and gather the scattered and turn their shame to praise and a name in all the earth. What a big turnaround for the Jewish people. Now let's talk about this name or fame for a moment. We often hear people wanting to be famous or uh, desiring fame of some sort. But let's understand, this is not the type of renown or fame that people have by trying to make a name for themselves. This is a type of fame that comes when someone does something right before God. If I was to ask you, who are the famous people in the Old Testament? First one, probably say Adam, Noah, uh, Abraham. He is said to be uh, fame, uh, uh, have a name in that, in that sense in Genesis 12. David, 1 Samuel 18.30. Not completely unlike us, but having a history, we Gentiles do not share. Uh, these Jews were unbelievers, lost in a dark and sinful world, ruled by Satan himself. Now what I'm saying is, we have a history similar, we believers have a his history similar to the Jews in history. Certainly not totally alike. There's some big differences. But we were all once unbelievers. And by that I mean both Jew and Gentile were both lost in a dark and sinful world. Ruled by Satan himself. The Jews, just like us, turn from sin self and Satan to God and Christ by faith. We receive God's righteousness through his Son in an eternal place in the kingdom of God. So do the Jews, the believing Jews. The point here with them there uh, here is from humiliation as a people in so many ways and their shame all that will be changed to praise and a name known and our verse isn't done the last line in all the earth they will be known for who they are and what they've done and what they've been through and how they've changed in all the earth one more time with our verse Behold, I will deal at that time with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame and gather the scattered and turn their shame to praise and to a name in all the earth. The great and good shepherd will deal with all those who have ever mistreated 
the Jewish believers throughout the world. He rescues those believers, gathers them to the promised land. It is there that their long oppression and humiliation that's come over the generations will be changed to praise and honor throughout the earth. Let's go look at part of the law in Deuteronomy 26, 16. So what we're doing here, we're looking at this passage from the law in Deuteronomy 26 that talks about some of the very things we're referring to here. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, and that you will obey him. Now remember, this is Deuteronomy. This is the second giving of the law by Moses. They're basically renewing the covenant. Verse 18. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised and that you are to keep his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. Now folks, the Jewish people had this handed to them. All they had to do was obey. And they would be well known throughout the world for their relationship to the one true God. They even become well known. And you can just see distant nations say, well, that Israel, they serve that one God called uh, Yahweh. And look how he blesses them and cares for them. That may not be attractive to them. And that might draw them to the God of Israel. This is all part of that purpose. But here we see not only what was said would happen if they turned to the Lord and obeyed in the Old Covenant, but it was also true and will be fulfilled under the New Covenant. So it's interesting that it was given during the Old Covenant, but they actually don't obey enough, and it only comes becomes fulfilled on the new covenant church where we too are involved. This never happened under the old covenant. It had its high points but never like it's described here. Um, but it will under the new when the people of Israel are brought back into the land and there they join with another group of sheep, the Gentiles. Our last verse in verse 20 uh, uh, is verse 20. We see an immediate address to those who will be taken captive in the exile. That goes back to our chart. And another look into the distant future. It's an appropriate verse to close out the book. At that time I will bring you even at that time I will gather you. See the emphasis here? For I will give you a name and praise for all the people of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Let's look at the first line. At that time, I will bring you. Even at that time, I will gather you. Here we see a double reference to a double fulfillment. Two mentions of the bringing and gathering of the people to the land after the, after the captivity and anticipating the future day of the Lord, gathering the people into the land of Israel. It's at that time when it says, For I will give you a name and praise for all the people or from all the people of the earth. On the first gathering, some of the world will know of the Jews' return. This is 
what we see indicated by the red marking at the end of the red marking when they return to the land. Some people will know about it. It'll become, but never re world renowned like we have in the future, uh, where they will be also praised as they come back into the land and they are with the Lord Jesus Christ. The last line's interesting. I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Actually, this, let's see, yeah, the last line. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord, they will have the land and the rule by one of their own. Believers will receive what was intended by our Lord at the same time Mankind, God's human creature, will receive what was intended for him at the beginning of creation, where Adam, Eve, had life with God forever. So we return to paradise. Now there are many references to these promised events to the Jewish people. Their return to the land from around the world their prosperity in the land. We've seen some of these in this book, their safety and security with the Lord. They'll also be fruitful and increase in number. There will be that central nation of Israel upon the world from which Christ Jesus himself will reign. Now there are some fantastic verses on this scene of the blessings that believers receive during the millennium. And, of course, much of it is addressed to the Jews who anticipate this great time in the kingdom of God. Let's read some of these. We're going to look at three of the longer ones. So here we get a description of what it's going to be like in the kingdom of God. The Jewish people with the Lord. Now, we're going to be there, too. It's just that this is addressed to the Jews. And that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And by the way, folks, this hasn't happened yet. All right. Ephraim's jealousy will vanquish and Judah's enemies will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of Philistia to the west. Together they will plunder the people to the east. They will lay hands on Edom and Moab and the Amorites will be subject to them. In other words, this is the world rulership of Jesus Christ along with believing Jews. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. Isn't that interesting? With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. He will break it up into seven streams so that men can cross over in sandals. You'll be able to walk across the well-known ancient river, the Euphrates. Final verse in Isaiah. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. So there'll be a path to walk to Israel from the area of Assyria. So we see there's a major geographic change, I should say many geographical changes that will take place during this kingdom of God on earth that we often call the millennium. From Jeremiah, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. 
In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is a name by which he will be called the Lord our righteous. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, As surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, As surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of the, all the countries where he has banished them, then they will live in their own land. Notice the contrast. At one time it used to be Israelites came out of Egypt. But in this future gathering, they are said to be brought from the north. That's the opposite direction, as well as all the countries from which they've been scattered. Isn't it also interesting how from Isaiah we get a little bit of different, a little bit of different slant, a little bit, little bit of different of information on it. You get all these together, you get a pretty good color picture of what's going to happen. From Jeremiah again. A short one from Jeremiah 31, 11 and following. We'll close with this. Jeremiah 31, 11. For the Lord will ransom Jacob and redeem them from the land of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord. Here we see some of the prosperity that will come to them. The grain, the new wine, and the oil, the young of the flocks and herds, they will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Now let me just pause here for a moment. In those days and times, this was the great stuff to have. All right, plenty of grain, new wine, oil, everything you needed, and the good stuff. Today, I expect we'd want to see other things than flocks and herds, new wine, if we were to have our request for what we wanted in the millennium. But for those Jews in those days, this was the best of the best. Verse 13, Then maidens will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priest with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. So here we see the fulfillment of these last verses we just read. When it says, for I will give you a name and praise for all the people of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Oh, what a blessed time that will be, that kingdom of God on earth. As we see here, that's going to come to these Jewish believers and to be shared by us, us Gentile believers. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have been able to study through another one of your books. We thank you that your precious word has fed us, has enlightened us, has challenged us, and moved us to realize that we have something wonderful to look forward to. So no matter what troubles we face now, it's incomparable to the future blessing that we have with you. We thank you for these things. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.